Well, would you please stand and welcome our teacher this morning, Sean Weir. Good morning. God bless you. Please be seated. And you can take your Bibles and you can join me in 1 Peter chapter 3. What we'll see in the text this morning is the way that the early church grew and multiplied. And as you remember, the early church was built in a large measure by suffering witnesses. Remember, Peter is writing to suffering Christians who are at the beginning of what would become centuries of harsh persecutions. And yet, this message of hope, along with lives lived with practical goodness, commends the gospel to other people, even our persecutors, in deeply compelling ways. So that in an empire that made Christianity illegal, it spread across it like wildfire. That's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to consider our answer of hope. Our text, 1 Peter chapter 3, read it with me. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and with respect and having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. A brief prayer. Father, let us this morning have the heart of Jeremiah the prophet, that your words may be found and we may eat them, and that they may become the joy and the delight of our hearts. Father, let us feast on your word this morning. We've eaten enough of the world this week. Help us, God, to have ears and hearts, minds ready to rejoice at, to see your truth, and to walk away, Father, with greater devotion and greater faith and a greater joy and zeal to be an everyday witness of the glorious gospel of Christ. We ask this, Father, in the name of your Son and for your glory. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Again. At this time, Peter is writing to persecuted Christians, as we've seen across Asia Minor in the first century. And they're enduring real slander, real ridicule, real marginalization. At this point, Nero hasn't entirely lost his mind, but he soon will. And he's going to blame that great fire in Rome on all the Christians, sparking off centuries of Christians being put to their death for their faith. Thrown to the lions, right? In the Colosseums and the like. And even though the Christians could sing with Billy Joel, we didn't start the fire, what you find is the more they were persecuted, the more the gospel spread. How? Why? Because they live this text right here. They held to the gospel hope in their real and present suffering. And so if you squeeze them, this is what comes out. And it only multiplies. And it only spreads. You see, guilt won't motivate us to be effective witnesses for Christ. But hope will. Honor will. Love will. Your heart's greatest treasure will. And it's those kind of things that Peter's talking about here. The real and the authentic and the genuine transformation of a gospel-shaped heart. Deep motives that make us effective witnesses. Speaking from a filled and overflowing heart. And in a sin-stained world filled with brokenness and darkness and death, we provide an answer of hope. And boy, the world needs it. Remember, we saw Peter say very similar things last week to the ladies and to their witness. It's not the external adorning, but it's that hidden person in the heart. Because the inner and the outer life are inseparable aren't they? What happens within will be displayed to all, and especially when you're suffering. Those are the hours when you really show out what is most 
precious, when it seems like everything else is being taken from you. That's when you truly show the treasures on the inside. And as Americans in our context, I don't think we live in a time with great hostility to the gospel, not nationwide. You see pockets of it. But I would characterize the majority of our cultural context as a people of either a dullness or a hardness to hearing. There's a great spiritual sleepiness in our lands. It seems most are just happy without the gospel. And you see this especially in unchurched and dechurched people groups. You have the unchurched, they're those who have grown up their whole lives without the church, and they really have no reference for it. Uh, no, I mean, they still celebrate Christmas because, I mean, everybody likes presents, right? But they've never actually heard the gospel in a compelling way. And then we have the dechurched. Those are those who went to church at some point in their past, but they stopped going somewhere along the line for many different reasons. And in my experience here where we live in central Pennsylvania, this is the group that you most often come across. Have you seen this? Yeah, wayward sons and lost daughters. And they're wandering about with a thousand unanswered questions. And it is our joy and it is our privilege and it is our purpose in this place to give them what everybody needs, an answer of hope. So we'll see Peter emphasize these three key themes for this everyday evangelism, everyday witness that every Christian is called to this morning. Number one, be about practical goodness in your communities, even while suffering. Number two, honor Christ from a true and revering heart. And number three, develop a daily readiness to speak. First, we're going to see being about all practical goodness. Verse 13, Peter wrote, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Remember, we saw last week, we are here to bless because we've been called to inherit a blessing, right? So we should live in pursuit of a virtuous life, a holy life, being about goodness and exhibiting real and practical good deeds to those in our communities that we come across. Today, it seems everyone's concerned about being on the right side of the next societal debate. There's nothing wrong with having opinions, but we should be about more than trending word battles or speaking to the next cultural triggers, whatever they may be. Let's be most concerned about being authentic, living true holiness according to everlasting virtues. You know why? Because Christ-likeness transcends every culture. However it may change and however it may adapt, it might look totally different a week from now. Christ-likeness transcends it all, and it draws all from whatever they may be entangled in. So we want to be those who are about this practical goodness. And then Peter says rhetorically, who will harm you if you're zealous for what is good? To which the first century Christians could respond, uh, my neighbors? Like everybody? <laughs> They're being harmed. And remember, eventually it's escalating. They're going to be put to death for their faith. But what Peter's really talking about here is the long view, the ultimate sense. He's speaking in the Romans 8.31 sense here. If God be for us, who could be against us? And yeah, you can fill in your blank, I can fill in mine. But if God be for us, who ultimately can do me lasting harm? Amen? Maybe it's the whole neighborhood. Maybe it's the, our whole nation. Maybe it's Satan and all his hosts arrayed against us. But if God be for us, ultimately, they cannot prevail. And you're guaranteed in Christ you do. So then who is there to harm you for doing good? Even if you suffer for righteousness sake, the ultimate answer is no one. Because sometimes good deeds will win over people. Sometimes righteousness lived in a Christian life will convict the other souls around you and it'll cause them to be drawn and come to Christ. But Peter's clear, sometimes they will harm you for it. Jesus said, they've hated me they're going to hate you. It's without a cause. But even so, we see here Peter is encouraging, and boy, they would need it. And I think we do too. If you suffer for your faith, if in all your demonstrations of goodness, all you receive back is aggression and hate, you're going to be just fine. Just like Psalm 91, because ultimately, they can't truly 
harm you. And here's where we hold on to our hope. Because Christ has already conquered. The war is already won. And in the end, every one of us wakes up in resurrection. Amen? Oh, the body they may kill. But this means that Christians can live in a hostile setting and be truly without fear. In fact, look at verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Full stop, period. That's a promise. And so have no fear of them. Neither be troubled. You can hear the echo of the Beatitudes here, can't you? Hey, Peter was there in person to hear that one. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're blessed now and forevermore. Don't forget it. So then our call is to live a life of practical goodness, even if people don't like it. Be a good neighbor. Be a good friend. Be a good citizen. Be a good employee. Be a good spouse. Be a good child. Live and give and surprise people by responding to their hate and their hostility with blessing and kindness. That's how we turn the world upside down. That's how they turn the Roman Empire upside down. Let them see those fruits of the Spirit of God in your life. And you know and I know they're undeniable, aren't they? And Peter shifts here to say, have no fear of them, neither be troubled. I mean, a little bit of fear is appropriate, right, Peter? I mean, a little, like, I'll tell you, if anything will prevent us from having an effective Christian witness, it is the fear of man, isn't it? Fear of their rejection. Fear of them not thinking you're cool. And I think for most of us, if we're honest, it's just fear of making it awkward. Right? Don't be afraid. When it comes to sharing the gospel, the fear of man has held everyone in this room back more than we'd probably like to admit. Right? There's a reason why it is said people are more afraid of public speaking than dying. But Peter came to know in Christ something that truly conquers those fears. He was hiding for fear of men, wasn't he? Yeah. And he turns around and he says to us, do not fear them. Don't you even be troubled by their response. He's lived something here and he wants us to have it too. We don't need to rise and fall in our hearts based on how they respond to the truth. Why? Because the gospel is bigger than all of us. It's bigger than them. It's bigger than you. And it's bigger than your fear. And it's not mine. And it's not yours. The gospel is God's master plan of salvation for sinners. And one day, every man will stand before the throne and give account. So you know what my job is? Live it. Reach their ears. And only God and his good pleasure can bring it from the head to the heart. You see, with these first century saints, the gospel... Since their time, it's traveled around the world, hasn't it? And yet it's been said, and it's true even today, the longest distance truth ever travels is the 18 inches from the head to the heart. And I can't do that for them. You can't do that for them. Only God, by the power of his spirit, can accomplish that miracle. And make no mistake, it's a miracle every single time. So it's good to be clear about what God alone can do in a man and what my simple responsibility is, right? So it's not my good sales pitch and I got to close that deal, right? It's not a marketing strategy. How am I going to get it out to... No, the metric isn't even numbers. Noah was one of the greatest preachers of all time. You know how many people repented at Noah's preaching? It's only his family that gets in the boat, right? Right? My responsibility is daily faithfulness. And then I can do that for my Lord without fear. Isn't that beautiful? Then my daily witness is because I really just live for Christ, whether people are looking or not looking. Because in my heart, he's honored above all, the greatest treasure of my soul. And that on the inside will inevitably come out. And then you squeeze me, that's going to just come out even more. Even when suffering then. But my effectiveness in reaching other people, however I might try to measure that, is no longer now my value or my identity, how worthy I feel of a Christian today because of how my coworker responded. 
No, first the gospel has saved me. And you know who it saved me from? My biggest problem. Me. Because I'm the one who tells myself, oh, if you just phrased it better. Oh, if you just would have... No. I'm saved from their condemnations because I'm saved from my heart's own. And so now I don't live by their approvals and I don't die by their disapproval. I'm free from them because I'm free from me. See, the gospel saves you. And then when that becomes greatest treasure, it will inevitably come out as an overflow of a rejoicing heart. And now I'm no longer insecure in social interactions because I'm not trying to figure out who I am by them anymore. I know who I am. Instead, now I can show courage. I can share my faith, even under harsh opposition, like these heroes before us in the first century did. And it's not that we don't care what they think of us. We're gentle, we're kind, we love, but we're most concerned about our Father's hearts towards us. If they believe and they become saved, we rejoice, all the angels in heaven rejoice. And you get to join in that joy. One sinner who repents. That's how big of a deal one person is. I think that's worth our time then. But if they respond with hostility, which some will, I inherit a blessing as I endure it. Either way, the gospel has shaped my heart. That's a win, 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 isn't it? Amen. It's also otherworldly. And one of the things that will spark, because that looks quite different than every other Joe and Sally out there, is it will spark questions, which is what verse 15 speaks to. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Again, an Isaiah reference. This is to Isaiah 8 that Peter is referencing here. It's a text where God is speaking to a scared Israel with the coming Assyrians. You don't need to fear them. And then he says, you don't need to be afraid of their fears. What a line. Instead, Peter then says, we are to honor Christ as holy. Oh, who makes my heart tremble? Who do I rightly reverence and fear? Christ, my Lord, as holy. And when you truly tremble in your heart at who Christ your Lord is, you will have no fear of men. So revere Christ. Don't revere people. And note those two words, always and anyone. So who is it that we should be on the lookout for as we go about commending Christ by our righteous living daily? Anybody. Okay, but like what, like nine to five? No, no. Always, right? You never know when God has that moment lined up. Many of you are in this room today because there was a moment where you found yourself at the crossroads of your life and God had that divine appointment lined up where someone just stepped into your life in that moment. And from that point out of nowhere, the gospel truth was presented and God brought it from the ear to the mind to the heart and you've never been the same. Always, anyone, God could have that divine appointment lined up. I, I just had a, a guy like that a day ago where God had a man lined up who needed to hear the gospel story desperately. And afterward, he had tears in his eyes and he told me, this is no coincidence that you turned down this hallway. Now, I didn't know that. And I didn't plan for that. I didn't have time to psych up and have a mini sermon ready for that guy. You know what I was doing? I was thinking, I'm getting my noisy one-year-old out of another embarrassing public situation again by going down this hallway. But down that hallway was the man whose heart needed Christ that day. Always anyone. Remember when it was you. And then you turn around and do the same for others. This is practical, lived, everyday evangelism. This isn't some big program. This is the real way that the living God, by those who revere Christ in truth in their hearts, change entire nations. Peter is in effect saying, don't wait on the perfect day and then share the gospel. Because the reality is, we could find an excuse every day, can't we? Who here in this room has ever woken up and thought, here it is, it's the perfect day. I have no troubles today. I have nothing pressing on my schedule. Today's the day. Now, everyday evangelism says, let's go. Every day. To who? Anybody. Everybody. 
And it's not standing up in front of a stadium crowd of thousands of people and, and, and being a Billy Graham. Although, you know, don't turn down that opportunity. I, that, that would be cool. I would love that. But the, the real thing is just live it where you are, in your family, in your spheres of where you go every single day. Be a sermon that they can see. And how do I do that? Oh, live a life of practical goodness. There's that great quote by Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. <laughs> so often, then when necessary, are going to be those moments that are prompted by your holy lifestyle. Why is she like that? Well, I can't deny it. There's something holy about her. There's something different. There's light coming from her. And remember what Peter is telling us the key here, hope. Why? Because I'm thinking about something beyond this right here and right now. He's not saying with lofty arguments or with clever rhetoric or deep skills in apologetics, not doing TED Talks. You know what he has in mind? Ordinary conversations. It's not a manufactured thing. It's a real thing. The reason they ask and the response you're supposed to give is supposed to be coming from why Christ is more precious to you than anything. And so they have to ask you, what is that all about? And then you don't give a trite, canned answer, a memorized line. You answer from a sincere heart. It's not a technical answer. It's your answer. Why? Because you know him. And you love him. Here's why I have hope beyond this life. Beyond this world. Beyond this persecution. Beyond this suffering. Beyond the grave. You see? It's not just preachers. Every Christian. It's your answer. What does it mean to you? Why would you say to that person, the best is still yet to come? Because I have an answer of hope. Because the tomb is empty, the throne is occupied, and the king is returning. All right, well, how do I get that kind of heart, Sean? Revere Christ as Lord and as holy in your heart. That he is of peerless worth. There's no one else in your heart who has that place. Greatest treasure of my soul. Peter is showing us effective witness is not so much about argumentation, but adoration. I think we know Peter was no Paul. Yeah? Paul's the one with the learning, the credentials. Peter's a backwoods fisherman. He was mocked by the qualified and the educated. But when Peter stands and opens his mouth, the gospel breaks into the hearts of thousands. You can say what you will about this man. And they did. And they'll say things about you too. But one thing you can't deny. That man loves the Lord. All of his hope is in him. And so all of his answers come from a genuine place. That's effective witness. You see, if Christ the Lord is holy to you, they can see it in your eyes. They can't deny it in your life because it's coming from an authentic heart. And now they're on the spot. Not you. Because now they're the ones who are going to have to make a choice. Is he a stumbling stone? Or is he the living, the chief, the corner, the rock of ages? See, our job's quite simple, isn't it? Just keep loving the one you already love. And let that overflow of your hope in him spill out. In those natural moments that God will line up for his glory. We have an answer of hope. And there's so much negativity and pessimism and despair in our society, even among Christians. Everyone can go on and on about how bad it is and how it only looks like it's getting worse. You know what you don't see a lot in this world? You don't see a lot of hope in the gospel. And that's what we bring. That's the matter. That's the most important matter that we stand to defend. We speak of better things, more glorious things, a better kingdom than this one. A better world than this one. A new heaven and a new earth. 
A place and time where there'll be no more death, no more disease, no more injustice, and no more suffering. Who doesn't want to hear about that? Remember, this whole context is suffering. And our hope not only sustains us, Peter is showing us, through suffering, but there's this other side of it too. It shines out of us in opportunities of suffering, if it's truly in us. So when plans fail, and they will fail, and when dreams fade, and they will fade, and when life hurts, and it's going to hurt, we can still abound in hope. And a watching world will be drawn to us. And they might not understand it. They might decide to mock it and deride it. But in their heart of hearts, they cannot deny. You have something they don't have. And they know they desperately want it. And note, and this is important, Peter not only tells us what to answer, but he tells us how to answer. Look at the back end of that verse. Do it with gentleness and respect. Well, they're not very gentle to us. Well, they're not very respectful to us. Yeah, you're called to be better. Proclaim Christ in a Christ-like way. Not with haughtiness, but with mildness. Not with ugly defensiveness, but with graciousness. Speak to petty cruelty with benevolent kindness. That'll turn some heads. Receiving shame and yet out holding out the truth with respectful dignity to your persecutors. Enduring abuse and yet remaining gentle under it. A key to remember is this. The goal is not to win an argument, but a person. You win people through gentleness, not cockiness or arrogance. A gracious tone is persuasive. And it comes from a place of rest inside you. There's great strength in gentleness. And that, that's true biblical masculinity, by the way. It's not the other wrong things that are represented. The greatest strength is in gentleness. You have the mighty warrior David, who in faith can send armies of pagans to flight. And yet in Psalm 18, he says to God, your gentleness made me great. How powerful can gentleness be? In Proverbs 21, 15, it says, a soft tongue, or it could be translated, a gentle word will break the bone. Gentleness. In a culture consumed by toxifying effects of social media, gentleness is not a virtue very often seen, is it? But for the first century believers, how they shared about Christ proved their hope in him as much as anything that they said about him. Because under suffering, under mocking, under deep cruelty, they responded with the hope that's in them, the eternal truth to their persecutors with gentleness and respect, just like Christ. Verse 16 then says, we can do this now having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be what? Put to shame. It's embarrassing for them, not you. How do I maintain a good conscience while suffering? Peter's told us. Number one, live a faithful life while suffering. A life filled with practical, thoughtful goodness for others. And number two, respond to their harshness with goodness, gentleness. It takes care of you. It takes care of them. And your conscience is kept. And this is important. Because when accused, those words can enter in if we're not keeping our conscience, right? Satan is called the accuser, yeah? He's good at lying, and he's good at those personal things that enter a little too deep. When we live this, your conscience is kept. When accused, you maintain your righteousness in your heart. They speak against your good behavior in Christ, and their lasting outcome, not yours, will be embarrassment. It's how Paul, even though slandered, imprisoned, and accused, could stand up in Acts 23 and say, I have lived in a good conscience before God up to this day. You see, a clear conscience will help you deeply when facing a hostile world. Because they'll accuse you of all sorts of things. 
But you can know in your heart, my conscience is right. And a good conscience gives you great boldness. Look at verse 17. Here's why. Because it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Again, we've seen in Peter, you can suffer for a whole lot of reasons. You can suffer for doing evil, and uh, you're not going to be praised for it. But let's remember to suffer for good and righteous reasons. And remember, especially in suffering, suffering's no excuse for sin. We don't respond to evil with evil. We overcome it by what? Goodness. So when maligned, we don't respond with the same. Peter said, it's better, it's better to suffer for doing good. Again, the only way this makes sense is if you're looking beyond the suffering, yeah? When you're realizing there's going to be a time in my life when the suffering is going to end, and then there's going to be an entry into glory that will never end, right? Clinging to gospel hope. This life is short, and the real is to come. Remember, he said this in chapter 1 to us to start us off. Our suffering is for a little while. You know what that means? This whole life. A little while. (laughs) Remember, for Christians, this is as bad as it's ever going to be. And there's no suffering in what's promised and coming to us. So some may respond with faith in the gospel to your everyday living. Others are not. Some will respond, and we shouldn't think it a strange thing, with persecuting and mocking. Don't give up on them. Tomorrow is another day. Saul still turned into Paul's. They don't believe in him. He believes in them. And every day we wake up and Christ hasn't come back, there's one more day for the prodigals to come home. We stay consistent. We stay kind. And this is how those first century saints brought Christ to all of the known world. It's already bad. It's about to get way worse for them. But in three centuries' time, what started in Jerusalem with 11 trembling apostles becomes the majority religion of the entire pagan Roman Empire. We're still appreciating the fruits and the roots of that today, aren't we? Rome was won by suffering while doing good. And that's what the whole life of Jesus himself was like, wasn't it? Jesus went about, the Bible tells us, doing good. Was he appreciated? No. But he loved everybody. What a beautiful life. What a model to follow. He suffered all of it with a hope in mind, a view and a joy of the glory yet to come. And suffering was his path to exaltation. That's what the next paragraph is about. We're going to look at that next week. But think about it to close here. In all of his suffering, under all of his persecution, what was he like? He was gentle, wasn't he? He was kind, wasn't he? And he was winsome because of it, wasn't he? Telling all the weary and all the heavy laden to come to him for rest. And now we get to do the same. And what a joy, what a privilege to share him, my heart's greatest treasure, working with God, working with our Lord, working for the kingdom to draw the hopeless and the lifeless to everlasting life, fellowship without end with the Father, with the Son, and guess what? With all of us. And in those days, do you think you're going to turn around to that person and be like, hey, remember when you persecuted me? (laughs) Just so thankful there's one more added to the kingdom. And I never forget when I was the one. May we all live and speak out of an overflow of love for our Savior. In honor from within first in my own life of his lordship. And may that spill out in genuineness from us. We don't have to be overly mechanical. We don't have to be very clever. We just need to love our Lord. We need to place our hope in the kingdom. And God will be God. And God will line up those moments to change someone's life forever. What do I need to do? Pursue goodness. Have Christ-centered reverence within. Be filled with gospel hope. And just be ready for one of those always. 
and anyone kind of opportunities that we encounter. Be ready with an answer of hope. Amen? Amen. Father, help everybody, every one of us, get over the foolish reasons inside that we tell ourselves we're not qualified for such a task. Help us, God, to get over our own insecurities, over the fear of men that holds each of us back, in some degree, every single one of us, from being who we desire to be for you and who we desire to be for our Lord. Help us see, God, that the way that we overcome our fear is by honoring your Son as holy in our hearts. There's no one else who makes us respond the way that he responds. We've never seen such beauty. We've never seen someone so altogether lovely. Never seen such a demonstration of grace like I've seen in your Son on the cross. Let that be stirring within us, Father, so that those things just show out from us. Let us have a full cup, Father, so that when we get bumped, it just spills out of us to one of those opportunities that you line up for someone's life to come to the light. Help us, Father, to grow in this, to have a zeal for this, to draw men and women from the darkness, from the snare of the devil, bring them into the joy everlasting of knowing you and your son forever. We ask this, God, because we know your kingdom's the true kingdom. Your power is the real power, and you alone deserve all the glory. We ask this humbly, Father, in the name of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ and all of God's people said. I love you all, and God bless you.